Hey Music Junkies, Professor of Rock, Adam Reeder here. I'm actually sitting in my living room uh, on my Elvis couch. <laughs> I have an Elvis couch. White vinyl couch with uh, Elvis Presley pillows. My tribute to the king. Everybody needs an Elvis couch in their living room. Anyway, I got my tape table behind me. You've seen it in our interviews. I love this set piece in the interview because uh, artists and bands, uh, they'll actually sometimes look for their tape. It's pretty cool. They'll find it, share a story. It's a little awkward when they can't find it. <clears throat> But, uh, you know, we try. Anyway, this is just my iPhone. I'm not going to send this in to be edited or colored or any fancy hullabaloo. This is just going to be uh, the living room sessions, really just on the fly, off the cuff, top of mind. And I want to have a discussion as, as a community, maybe even a friendly argument about great music subjects. Do this all the time with my producing partner. Uh, we're just very passionate about music and a good friend of mine, he... It's been in the music industry forever, and, and we'll talk every day. And it gets into, you know, what was the greatest Beatles album and why? What was the greatest Motown single or the greatest guitar solo, the greatest drummer, greatest number one song from any decade? And it'll turn into a friendly discussion, and then it gets uh, pretty crazy. I mean, we'll be just, are you kidding me? You know, you've been there, you know. So I want to do that here. And I want to start with what was the greatest year of the 80s, 1984, or 1987. Now we could talk about 83 or 85 or 86 or 82, so many great years. But to me, 84 and 87 had such a, a rich diversity through all the genres. And I'm gonna go through the different genres and I'll, I'll try to cover like three or four artists per genre and the big albums or big artists or songs of that year. Do the best I can. We don't have hours. I'm gonna try to keep this under uh, 15, 20 minutes if we can. So. If I haven't covered an artist, it's not because I don't love them. It's just because we don't have the time. And we can talk about it actually in the comments below. Because we're going to have a poll in the link below. You can click on that. It'll take you to the community page and you can vote on it. And please leave your comments. Let's talk first here. And then we'll go from there. I love the 80s more than any other decade. Not only because I grew up there and it was my music discovery. But it's also because I feel like more than any other time... I mean, uh, when the 80s started, um, or really, let me say this, since the beginning of the rock era in the 1950s, up through the 80s and beyond, uh, many musical genres have emerged from a subculture and they've grown in popularity to achieve mass appeal or mass success. In the 80s, though, it seemed like all of those genres, pop, R&B, uh, alternative, new wave, uh, you get the point, all the different types of music that were there, hard rock, metal, it all was represented, all came together, especially on the radio. If you turned on a mainstream radio station in the 80s, top 40 station, within an hour, you could hear Stevie Wonder. And then the next time it could be Duran Duran. And then it could be Kenny Rogers or Dolly Parton. Then Bon Jovi. Then the Human League. Then Shaka Khan. Then UB40. You get the point. I mean, Eddie Rabbit, you could go from Eddie Rabbit to Depeche Mode in the top 40. That was music diver musical diversity. We just don't have that anymore. But all of those genres were represented, even rap with the Beastie Boys and LL Cool J and Run DMC. Anyway, so I just think it was a fascinating time for music because it was a decade of musical synthesis. Such a fertile period for creativity because technology was coming in. You had the old school, like in what they were doing at Motown where they were creating music with everything, using everything but the kitchen sink, you know, broken tambourine to get this certain sound. But then technology came in, it's like they shook hands right in the middle. So <clears throat> anyway, that's why I want to analyze those two years. We'll start with other years down the road, but uh, that's that's why I love it. In 1984 or 1987, I'll throw out the key events, the songs, the albums, the artists, and then uh, for each year, and again, do the best I can with those, and then, then take the poll at the end and you leave your comments and we'll go back and forth. Let's go ahead and start out with uh, 1984 versus 1987 mainstream music. <clears throat> In 1984, excuse me, 1984, you had Michael Jackson Thriller. It came out in late 1982, had its biggest impact in 1983, but was still making waves in 84. He released the title track, Thriller, and the music video, the making of Thriller. For any 80s kid, you know as well as I do, we wore that tape out. We watched it over and over again. It had so much impact. Um, and that's what I'm talking about, though. In any given year, an artist could release an album and it could have impact in several different years. 
That's going to happen in 84 to 87. We'll do the best that we can with that. Well, Michael Jackson Thriller is the best example of that because it was still having a huge impact in 1984. And really the blockbuster album was, was ascent, really making its ascent to its peak in 84. Started really with Frampton Comes Alive where it was that huge album. Everybody was buying it in the 70s. But then you started to get into the 80s and it really started with Saturday Night Fever and then Billy Joel with, with The Stranger and 52nd Street. And you just had these massive albums that were like greatest hits albums and they were selling millions of copies. Really, Journey and Foreigner and Ariel Speedwagon with High Infidelity and Escape and Foreigner 4, those were massive and that led to the police synchronicity in 83. And uh, of course, Men at Work, uh, Business as Usual, these, these were... Albums that spent uh, 10 plus weeks on the top of the charts. It's of course, Michael Jackson Thriller. But then you had Prince, Purple Rain. Number one for 24 weeks in 1984. And I would say had the biggest impact in that year when he came out with Purple Rain. I mean, even Michael Jackson was shaking in his boots. And you look at the first three albums of Prince, you know. He was pushing the envelope, doing things that people were like, there's no way he can get away with this. He, he was... And there would be no way that anybody would say this guy's going to go mainstream. He obviously was a genius and had the talent, but what he was doing, but he did with, with Purple Rain. I mean, he, he created the blueprint with the movie and with the album that everybody's following. I mean, Eminem did it with 8 Mile and so many others. Whitney Houston with The Bodyguard. And uh, he, he really was the first. I mean, the Beatles did that, of course, with Hard Day's Night. But I think Prince was a, a marketing machine with that. But... I don't think he meant to be a marketing machine. That's the thing. I think that he was just such a genius that he could do anything he wanted. You think about When Doves Cry. I mean, a number one pop song without a bass line. And then Let's Go Crazy with, with the, the, almost the, the sermon from a funeral at the beginning. Uh, Dearly beloved, we're all gathered here to get through this thing called life. Every 80s kid knows that by heart. And, and we need that more than ever right now. It means so much in the times we're in right now. But Purple Rain, the title track, one of the greatest power ballads, which Prince actually, a uh, little tip of the hat to Neil Sean, a, a journey. I've got that story from Neil where <clears throat> they got a call from Prince because uh, Purple Rain sounded a little bit like Faithfully. I, I don't want to go on off of the tangent on that, but he just was such a visionary. And, and then you had Bruce Springsteen, Born in the USA. Are you kidding me? Seven top ten hits. Only Michael Jackson, Thriller, and Janet Jackson, Rhythm Nation have done that. And you know, Bruce Springsteen talks about his decision to write for a larger audience, to go into that pop territory. And he said with Dancing in the Dark, his first single, that that's as far as he would ever want to go into pop territory. And he probably went a little further than he should have. Uh, but that was a number two hit. It was Springsteen's biggest hit. He never had a number one hit. It's crazy. But that was held off the number one spot by When Doves Cry. And so Springsteen had a massive album that sold 15 million plus just here in the U.S. Then you had, um, and you think about it, if, if, if Bruce Springsteen wouldn't have made that decision to go mainstream, he might have had a career that was more like Jackson Brown. Maybe, maybe a little bit bigger than Jackson Brown, but it's interesting the decisions that artists make and, and how they go forward. And then, of course, he did Tunnel of Love in 1987, which... Uh, very personal album. But anyway, don't want to don't want to get off on a tangent. So you've got uh, Huey Lewis Sports. I mean, Huey Lewis was amazing. The Huey Lewis and the News it was released in 83, but it had its biggest impact in 84. I want a new drug. Harder rock and roll. Uh, if this is it, great songs from, from a, a hard-working bar band uh, from, from San Francisco. I just love Huey Lewis. And then Tina Turner, biggest comeback of the 80s, maybe the biggest comeback of all time, arguably, with with a private dancer and what's love got to do with it. I mean, her vocal on that it was set in stone at that point that she was the queen of rock. I mean, just such an incredible song. Go back and listen to those vocal nuances and Tina is just straight up. It's amazing. So that's, that's 84. Uh, then, then you compare that to 1987 In 1987, you had Bon Jovi and I know that slippery and wet hit in 86, but it has big, biggest impact in 1987 Living on a Prayer hit number one, and that just set the world on fire. And then you had Never Say Goodbye and, and Wanted Dead or Alive, which is my favorite Bon Jovi song. He became an icon, sex symbol from there, and, uh, and, and brought rock into the mainstream. I mean, it was already in the mainstream, but just bringing it so much more. And then 
Whitney Houston, Whitney. Whitney Houston was the first female to debut at number one. I want to dance with somebody. I don't care if you hate pop music. It's undeniable. I want to dance with somebody who loves me. Parentheses song. It's just incredible. We have the story of that song from Narda Michael Walden, which we'll share down the road. But, but Whitney was amazing. And then you had George Michael Faith. Really? George Michael was incredible. First British artist ever and the only British artist, solo British artist, who's ever had four number one hits in America. That all happened with Faith. I know that it had a big impact in 88, but Faith, the song went to number one. When you started hearing him play the guitar, jukebox, the leather jacket, well, I guess it would be nice. Come on. George Michael, right then and there, he stepped right up to the plate, shoulder to shoulder with Michael Jackson, Madonna, Prince, and the best of them. And I, I would put George Michael Faith as one of the greatest pop albums ever. And then, of course, U2, the Joshua Tree. I remember we got MTV that year because my dad was build, building a house. He was building it you know, by hand, his own two hands. And we were in a rental home. And uh, we had MTV for the first time ever. And I swear, the entire summer, I did not leave the television. And I saw U2, with or without you. Still haven't found what I'm looking for. Went out and bought the cassette tape, wore it out. Just incredible. I mean, you talk about a band going mainstream. It was an indie band, really, for a few years before that. Just the ascent of U2 at that time was just, to watch that and be a part of it was incredible. Michael Jackson, Bad. That came out in the fall of 87. Five number one hits. I know it had a big impact in 88, but we'll count it for 87 as well because uh, obviously he had a couple of number one hits from there uh, in 87. Um, five, no, he didn't do that on Thriller, so that was huge. Uh, so as far as... Uh, 84 versus 87 on the mainstream music, the biggest stars of that year. Another thing about 84 is, is five, five albums went to number one. It's the least amount of albums to go to number one because each one spent so, many, so much time there. You had Prince Purple Rain that was number one for 24 weeks. Michael Jackson Thriller for 15 weeks. You had uh, Sports, Huey Lewis snuck in there for one week. And then you had Bruce Springsteen Born in the USA for four weeks. And then Footloose, the soundtrack. We'll talk about that here in a second. If you compare 84 to 87, and it's tough because George Michael Faith, U2, the Joshua Tree, but I got to go with 84. I just feel like Bruce Springsteen, Prince, Tina Turner alone, those three right there. That's when, I might even say 1984 mainstream was the greatest year in music ever. Might be a toss-up between that and 1966. Let's go into the, really talk about the events of both years. In 84, you had Band-Aid, Do They Know It's Christmas?, Bob Geldof, mid-year, interviewed mid-year about that and a lot of the other artists who participated in Do They Know It's Christmas? And we have the story of that. We'll probably release it uh, in the month of December before Christmas. But that started a revolution and everything that followed with Live Aid and We Are the World. And that all started with, with that amazing idea, raised so much uh, to help people. And uh, music could, could create social change. It, it could before, but... But that just set the tone for everything to follow in the decade. And then you have the PMRC, Parental Music Resource Center. Tipper Gore was very afraid for us, for us kids. We had to have a parental advisory warning on the cassette. The Filthy 15, right? Led by Darling Nikki from Prince and, and uh, bands like Wasp and, and Judas Priest. And uh, what else did you have? Sugar Walls by Sheena Easton and... And uh, we're not going to take it by Twisted Sister for violence. She was afraid that we were going to start beating each other to a bloody pulp if we listened to that song. So funny. If Tipper could have seen then Cardi B, what's at number one right now, her mind would have been blown. She would have probably, probably stopped right there. Anyway, that was interesting. I love how like D. Snyder, Frank Zappa, amazing. And John Denver went and... Uh, testified that that was great you gotta go back and look at that now 87 had a lot of great events as well uh aretha franklin was the first female ever to be inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame the beatles were released on compact disc for the first time that was a big deal i remember my dad brought uh, those cds home he brought please please me home and the sound quality was just out of this world so i'd have to give tip of the hat to, to 84 on this one because Band-Aid, Do They Know It's Christmas Alone. Just, it just changed the world in so many ways. And rock. Let's talk about rock. 84 versus 87. In 1984, you had the album 1984 by Van Halen. I got to tell you, I was, I was in grade school. And I remember when I'd go to recess with my buddies, we'd talk about, you know, 
hey, what happened on the A-Team last night or Star Wars, you know, what was going to happen with Star Wars and Return of the Jedi and, and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Temple of Doom and all that. 1984 Van Halen was a huge part of that conversation every day. David Lee Roth, the great, man, what a front man. The guy could do the splits, you know. Eddie Van Halen can play with anybody. That was a topic of discussion with just regular kids on the playground. I remember that. Hot for teacher, I and mean, that was an education. And, and you know, Panama, I mean, just <clears throat> everybody had that tape. So that was huge. And, and then you, of course, had ZZ Top Eliminator, Everybody's like, man, look at those sweet beards. I mean, I, I mean, it was just this how he spoke as a little kid. And then Metallica, Ride the Lightning, For Whom the Bell Tolls. One of the greatest metal tracks ever. Um, and then Yes, Yes hit number one, a progressive rock band. And uh, with Owner of a Lonely Heart, that was great. Compare that to 87, you got Def Leppard Hysteria, which, mind-blowing. I know that it had a bigger impact in 88 with Pour Some Sugar on Me. Still released in 87, Animal hit its peak in 87, massive. Then you had Appetite for Destruction, Guns N' Roses. I mean, seriously, just like 1984 Van Halen, this was a discussion. Slash and Axl Rose, and we started wearing the bandana, and just, it was the snake and everything like that. Welcome to the Jungle hit the top seven in 87. And then you had White Snake. I mean, David Coverdell, man. Here I go again. I swear, in like 46 states, it's illegal to, to change the, the station if Here I Go Again is on. Such a phenomenal song. It just puts you in a great mood, makes you feel like you're 15 feet tall and indestructible. And to talk about a music video, that was definitely an education. Tawny, uh, Catan, Catan, uh, just incredible. And then, of course, you had uh, Heart. Bad Animals, we just talked about it a few weeks ago. Alone was the second biggest song of that. So if I were going 84 versus 87, as far as uh, rock goes, I'd give, I'd give the nod to 87. i got to go with like Def Leppard and Guns N' Roses. Really hard, though, because 1984 alone, Van Halen. Of course, you got Metallica, so ah, that one's tough. I'm going to have to change my answers depending on the comments. Leave your comment and tell us what you think of that one. Going into okay. pop for 1987, or 84, excuse me, we'll start with that. Madonna. Madonna took over, Holiday, released in 83, but peaked in 84, Borderline, Lucky Star, Like a Virgin was released, and the song hit number one in the last week of 84. Madonna just began, began her rise as the queen. And, um, and then you had Lionel Richie, Can't Slow Down. I mean, Can't Slow Down, released in 83, but Hello and Penny Lover and Stuck on You, just great songs. I always love Lionel Richie, he's just so great. And... Cindy Lauper, Girls Just Want to Have Fun. I mean, that's one of the top three, or excuse me, top five most viewed videos from the 80s on YouTube. Cindy Lauper inspired so many people after that, so many female artists. Great songwriter and um, great singer. Just um, time after time. I mean, come on. That's a standard if there ever was one. And then you had Phil Collins. Uh, Phil Collins, sorry, I had a little low battery thing that came up. Phil Collins, Against All Odds, Take a Look at Me Now. For anybody that, that doesn't like Phil Collins, I mean, this was where he just ripped open his chest and let out his soul. I mean, that vocal on that song and those words, one of the most heart-wrenching love songs ever, nominated for an Oscar. They didn't even let poor Phil perform the song at the Oscars. The guy gets no respect, I'll tell you, but he's got mine. Anyway, 87 pop, you had Gloria Estefan and the Miami Sound Machine with The Rhythm Is Gonna Get You. The rhythm definitely gets you with that song. It's a, it's a great Latin pop. I remember a great story about this real quick. There was a kid in my school. Uh, I, I remember, I think it was in fifth or sixth grade. And I was walking down the hall. And I knew this kid a little bit. We'd talk about music. He looked uh, like he was about to burst into tears. You know, he was just broken up about something. Either a girl had just, you know, broken up with him or his, his dog had died. I don't know. But I walked up and I said, Joe, are you okay? And he said... Man, I just heard the Miami Sound Machine broke up. <laughs> I'll never forget. I'm like, he's like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I said, Joe, you know, put my hand on his shoulder. I said, Joe, I'm pretty sure that the next Gloria Estefan album is going to sound exactly like she sounds. You're not, she's got, not going to skip a beat without the Miami Sound Machine. It's going to be okay. It'll, it'll work out. You think? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> It was like the Beatles had broken up. I mean, biggest Miami Sound Machine 
fan this side of, of Florida, really. Only in Idaho, I got to tell you. Anyway, and then you had Debbie and Tiffany. Debbie Gibson and Tiffany fighting it out. Think about that. Uh, my sister was a huge Debbie Gibson fan. My sister, older sister, she was a cheerleader, popular girl at school. I was the, you know, the, the nerd, the, the outcast. And uh, I was really into Billy Joel's before I discovered New Wave. And, and, uh, and I remember she would argue with me all the time, Debbie Gibson's better than Billy Joel. And I said, are you kidding me, Piano Man? She could never write a song like Piano Man. I'd go back and forth and argue and just roll my eyes. But I remember that I was looking at the liner notes from her cassette tape of Out of the Blue. And at the very end, it says, you know, Debbie Gibson says, uh, I just want to thank my all-time inspiration, Billy Joel, who's inspired all of my songs, or something to that effect. And I just, I handed it over to her. I said, can you read that part for me out loud? I, I can't quite capture those words. And she started to read it, and I just dropped the mic right there. I was, it, it was over from there. And she's like, whatever. Anyway, I, I shared that story with Debbie Gibson. I interviewed her uh, and Tiffany on the same day. And, and uh, she got a, we got a chuckle out of that. But uh, I, was, I was Team Debbie, um, had a crush on both of them who didn't, but, uh, but anyway. And then, and then Phil Collins, you talk about Phil Collins' solo Genesis. You know, I know that, that Invisible Touch hit in 87, but uh, has big impact, or 86, had its biggest impact in, in 1987 for sure with, with Into Deep and Tonight, Tonight, Tonight. Pop, 84 versus 87, I really have to give the tip of the hat to, to 84. I have to give it to 84 with Cindy Lauper, Phil Collins. Um, you know, I just, that's where I'm going to do. So 84, 87, New Wave. New Wave in 84, the Smiths debut album. Are you kidding me? The Smiths, um, what difference does it make? Still ill, reel around the fountain. These were just life-changing songs and so and just so so raw morrissey and mar together for the first time and that album cover uh just incredible and culture club i mean culture club hit number one with karma chameleon and had a bunch of hits that year and boy george was an icon that was was really shoulder to shoulder with madonna that year and bruce springsteen and, and prince so you, you got to give it up there and and an icon for so many things that that we'd never seen before um great songwriter Great singer. And, and then, of course, you've got uh, Duran Duran hit number one with uh, The Reflex and Seven and the Ragged Tiger. And they had a great year. And then in 87, you had R.E.M. Document. This is where R.E.M. really went mainstream. I remember watching them every day on MTV. The One I Love would come on. And I just, I just loved it. And then it's the end of the world as we know it. I feel fine. Of course, you 2 we've already talked about. And then you had The Cure, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me. I mean, they're... Their first top 40 hit, uh, just in one of the greatest songs ever in Just Like Heaven. And then you had Crowded House, you know, Neil Finn, Don't Dream It's Over. The Beatles would have been jealous of that song. I'm sure, I'm sure John Lennon was looking down from, from rock and roll heaven and just just shaking his head in disbelief. What, really, just one of the best songs ever. And so I've got to give the, the nod to 87 on that one. I mean, R.E.M. and U2 and the, and the Smith Swan song. Strange Ways, Here We Come. It's a great album as well and, and really comparable. So, um, soundtracks, Footloose versus Dirty Dancing. Let's be honest, that's where we're at. Two movies about dancing. Footloose with the, the, you know, the title track, Kenny Loggins, tip of the hat to Chuck Berry, Denise Williams with Let's Hear It For The Boy. Such a catchy pop song. Great duet between Ann Wilson and Mike Reno and Almost Paradise. And then Dancing in the Sheets by Shalimar and and holding out for a hero, Bonnie Tyler. Of course, Dirty Dancing was great too because you, you had the, the number one hit I've had the time of my life, which was the big comeback by Bill Medley of the Righteous Brothers. I've interviewed him about that. I'll have to share that. But Jennifer Warren, who always seemed to have a big duet. And, uh, and then Eric Carmen had a big comeback as well. So that was great. You compare the soundtracks. I'm going to go with Footloose. I just thought every song on that was a hit. Sammy Hagar had a big song on there. And just on and on. Great soundtracks from both of those years. La Bamba in 87 and 84, you had uh, Streets of Fire with I Can Dream About You, Dan Hartman, one of my favorites ever. And then also Eddie and the Cruisers on the dark side. We're going to cover that in our 80s hidden gems down the road. R&B in, in, uh, in 84, you had Billy Ocean, Caribbean Queen. You had Ashford and Simpson who uh, saw, saw it as a rock. I mean, they wrote uh, Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing and, and Ain't No Mountain High Enough and 
And they had a great song there. And then you had the Pointer Sisters uh, with Jump For My Love and so many other songs and Shaka Khan with I Feel For You, which I think is a better version than Prince. Anyway, just great songs. And then uh, 87 was great too. You had Jody Watley and, and Prince uh, with Sign of the Times. Probably his best album, uh, his deepest album for me anyway. I just, I love that. The title track is just incredible. And then I'm going to give it to 87 for this band alone, The System. Don't Disturb This Groove. If you've never heard that song, you need to go listen to it right now. I want to interview uh, them about this song because it's one of my favorite songs ever. It's just such a phenomenal song. Lisa Lisa and Colt Jam as well. I mean, come on. Head to Toe and uh, Lost in Emotion. That was like the Motown for the 80s that had that throwback to that 60s sound. I loved it. So I'm going to give it to 87. And then I'm going to throw out two wild cards for both years. Um, one for each year. 1984, my wild card, just to get you thinking, is Weird Al Yankovic. Weird Al in 3D. Everybody had it. It became like Mad Magazine. It became this thing for, for uh, my friends. Uh, we just loved it. We, we love Weird Al. I'm going to cover, cover him very soon on a segment. He should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for, for really. Eat It and so many great songs. In fact, when I interview him someday, I've actually got little interview segments with each person that I've interviewed that he's done a parody of their song and I'm gonna put those in. And then my wild card for 86 would be <clears throat> The Grateful Dead. Grateful Dead with uh, Touch of Grey, top 10 hit for those guys. I think it's a great pop song. I'm gonna give the nod and the wild card to Weird Al. I, I have to, he's just, uh, he's a hero. Anyway, there you have it. I'm not gonna give you my final answer on 84, 87. I'll do that in the comments, but make sure to click on the poll below, leave us a comment, Let's have a great discussion about this. And then uh, make sure to pick up your Zanny glasses. Hit us up on Patreon. And if you like this content, hit that uh, you know, subscribe button. And we'd love to, to have you be a part of our community. And so until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. See you later.